Alles okay? Gut, gut. Um, if we unmute, we, no, it's, uh, we can do it yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Good. This is... Uh, Good afternoon and a warm welcome from Vienna. My name is Sebastian Schäffen. I'm the managing director of the Institute for the Danube region in Central Europe. Today we have a very special edition of our IDM on-site series. And for this occasion, we have teamed up with our neighboring country, Slovakia, with our good friends from Globsec. And with us is Alena Kutsko, who is the research director um, of Globsec in Bratislava. Hi, Alina. Good afternoon, everybody. This is a series of actions under the campaign as well from the side of Globsec, which is called Hub for Europe. And uh, today, as I said, we have a very special guest, um, His Excellency Johannes Hahn, the European Commissioner for Budget and Administration. Commissioner Hahn, thank you very much for taking the time and joining us today. Greetings, thank you, and um, you're welcome, and greetings from Brussels. So we will be talking today about the EU budget for the post-COVID-19 Europe, um, and especially also what does it mean to the citizens. And uh, we will be uh, talking about um, 45 minutes and also have the opportunity for our participants um, that I also warmly welcome uh, with this uh, to ask questions in our chat. Um, so please use the chat functions um, and we'll have a, a hopefully lively discussion about the EU budget. So with no further ado, I would like to uh, start with um, the negotiation process itself. So during the summit, uh, we could read headlines, especially in the German speaking media and uh, more so in Germany, that the EU is staring into the abyss that um, the uh, illusion of a united Europe uh, will end. And then uh, after the end of the summit, uh, the headlines changed to a historic day for Europe. Um, so we have the stellar opposites uh, within just uh, 90 hours of, of negotiations. And my uh, question would be, um, you have said before the summit that there are tough negotiations ahead. Um, but you have laid out um, a proposal and also predicted uh, more or less what the actual outcome is. So uh, my first question would be, how did you perceive the negotiations and how do you evaluate the outcome of the summit, Commissioner Hahn? Yeah, first and foremost, I would like to thank you for the initiative, uh, having the opportunity to explain and to discuss um, indeed the next multi-annual financial framework which is under um, uh, so say special uh, conditions uh, caused by the outbreak of the coronavirus and the necessary response we have to give. Having said this, I think um, the reaction time of the European Union, for instance, compared to the situation 10 years ago when we were uh, confronted with the uh, financial and economic crisis, where it took us um, one, two years, uh, more or less, this time it took only uh, a couple of weeks, so finally two to three months, uh, to agree finally on a real historic uh, package uh, in terms of uh, the overall volume. And I used to say that the next budget, of course, it has to be uh, finally discussed with the European Parliament and uh, there, will, there will be certainly some modifications. But uh, in general, one can really say it's a revolution uh, uh, compared to the current one, and it's not an evolution. So um, I think here we, we managed really to, to, to get the deal in a, in a rather um, quick uh, um, time frame. And uh, of course, it was this time very well prepared. I have also to admit that uh, the European leaders um, understood the, the urgency uh, for two reasons, the urgency to have an MFF in general, because here we are rather late, but this was finally 
um, um, affected due to the corona crisis and the inability to meet in person. Uh, and, and this is certainly something which could only be decided if uh, the leaders were in Brussels. And uh, this is why it could only finally took place uh, in July. Uh, and second, of course, they understood the urgency due to the, to the economic situation in Europe and uh, the potential uh, problems we will still face in the autumn and most likely also next year. So in that respect, I think uh, finally they managed it and uh, uh, the commission proposed an, an architecture and a volume which was finally uh, de facto uh, acknowledged because uh, the overall budget was uh, and is uh, more than 1.8 billion. Um, and um, there was a discussion uh, when it comes to the so-called top up, the next generation EU, which is uh, precisely the response to the crisis where we suggested uh, originally uh, that 500 billion should be available uh, um, uh, as grants uh, and another 250 potentially as uh, loans. And of course, you have seen discussions in the, in the run up to this uh, uh, European Council uh, the, the weekend before last weekend, where, for instance, Vogel said uh, there should be even no grants. And at the end of the day, uh, almost 80% of our proposal concerning grants survived. And uh, this is uh, important. This is necessary. Otherwise, we cannot really address probably, probably also means in, in due time, um, the situation of many member states. Thank you. Of course, maybe I should, uh, maybe, sorry, I should add, uh, of course, there are some elements which uh, finally uh, we are not really happy as a European Commission uh, in terms of details of the outcome. And this is, of course, that uh, uh, also there are increases in certain areas like um, uh, research and innovation for the General Horizon Program. We would have liked to see an even uh, uh, so a bigger increase the same applies for Erasmus, where de facto now the increase is almost is around 50%, but nevertheless, we would have liked uh, to see more. Um, we have seen uh, the deletion of a, a special window within the so-called InvestEU program, which was aiming to strengthen the um, European uh, um, so to say, autonomy in the, in the business sector. This has now to be implemented via the recovery and resilience facility, there has been a steep uh, cu cut uh, or a, a deep cut uh, in, the, in the health program. Uh, so if you look into some specific details, you will find some um, or neighborhood and, and foreign policy was also cut. Uh, so there are some areas where um, some painful interventions took place. And now we have to see if in the negotiations between the parliament and um, the, uh, the European Council, some adjustments uh, are finally possible. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And I exactly wanted to pick up a little bit on um, your point that you were making last and early in your intervention about the discussion with the European Parliament. As we know, the Parliament, uh, of course, uh, recognized that that's a historic deal but also that the parliament is ready to withhold its consent to the uh, MFF. Could you please lead us a little bit in more detail through the negotiation with the parliament? How do you see it? Which areas specifically do you think are possible to adjust and potentially at which timeline this can be done? Well, uh, um, currently the, uh, the council is uh, trying to um, uh, to agree on their sort of say final um, uh, negotiation um, uh, package for the negotiations with the parliament, uh, sort of say to implement the council decisions in a concrete uh, proposal. Then it will be submitted uh, to the parliament. I understand that. Uh, at least the technical level of first negotiations will start in the second half of August. Uh, uh, there is no actually really time uh, to waste. And I hope uh, so there's a very concrete political discussions can take place then um, in the 
um, uh, in September, and I hope uh, we get an agreement uh, at the latest, at the beginning of uh, uh, October, concerning uh, the, the the general budget. Why? Because for the for the next generation EU, we need uh, finally a ratification in at least 23 out of 27 uh, uh, European parliaments. We need the agreement of all member states, but in at least 23 member states, also uh, the parliament has a say. Uh, such a process usually takes, um, if there is no particular engagement, uh, up to two years. Uh, this is our experience. If we sort of say push, uh, the usual um, duration is around one year. Here, we really want to have um, um, a quick um, ratification process, uh, ideally till the end of the year, which is extremely ambitious. But we cannot start borrowing at the market any euro if we don't have uh, the agreement by all the member states. Um, but of course, there are different steps. Uh, the, the parliament concerning the top up has to be informed, has to be consulted. Uh, concerning the MFF, the Parliament has to give its consent, but if it comes to the sectoral regulations, uh, Parliament is indeed a, a co-decision uh, maker uh, like uh, the European Council, but I understand there are and there will be negotiations and agreements concerning a so-called inter-institutional agreement, which in particular gives the Parliament more um, involvement and engagement and control concerning the use of all the different parts of the of the budget for the next uh, seven years with the particular uh, part of uh, the next generation money, which should be, so to say, used within the first three years. Commissioner, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned that there are 23 national parliaments that need to uh, ratify the um, package. Do you see, any potential member states or the national legislature that can have an issue with ratification? And of course, if you would be willing to share with us which particular states or the national parliaments you see as the least happy with the deal. No, yeah, um, there is a certain uncertainty and this was also the, the reason why in particular the Dutch prime minister um, had a very tough stance in, in, in this debate, and this is uh, the Netherlands, uh, also because uh, they will have national elections in March next year. Uh, and of course, um, if uh, one like it or not, uh, very often uh, national elections, local elections, um, they are very often used also, uh, or European topics are very often used, misused, however you call it, uh, for also um, uh, internal domestic uh, uh, debates. And uh, therefore, there is some uncertainty. But I hope uh, that also uh, amongst the lawmakers, there is a, a general um, understanding about the urgency and the need. And one should finally not forget, and this in particular uh, concerns, um, let's say, richer countries, smaller countries, medium-sized countries, like uh, the Netherlands, that uh, uh, countries of uh, this kind within the European Union benefit overproportionately uh, um, uh, from, the, from the European single market. And the European single market can only function if each and every parcel of it uh, is, is, is sort of say, performing. And this is exactly what we aim at with the, uh, with the recovery and resilience package uh, to, to help picking up uh, each, uh, uh, each, um, economies, each economy uh, to, 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 say, to, to start um, or to, to restart the, the business, the different businesses uh, as soon as possible. And therefore, um, each country should have a huge interest uh, that uh, also the others, the other participants in the single market are equally well performing and therefore I have some confidence that this is well understood uh, amongst uh, um, um, lawmakers in the different countries. Thank you, Commissioner. Another uh, point of discussion is probably going to be the clause on 
the uh, rule of law that is in the final draft. And um, if we look at the different interpretations um, after the summit, everybody uh, more or less declared itself to be a winner, which is not necessarily a bad sign after such tough negotiations. Um, from the commission's point of view, uh, you have already uh, stated in May 2018 that you rather see this as a reverse qualified majority that would be necessary to um, buy to the rule of law and the connection with the payment of the funds. Um, we have seen now different interpretations in this final text. It's also part of, of a debate um, in the European Parliament. Um, can you shed some light if um, these different interpretations will um, actually lead to uh, a problem in the ratification, uh, be it in, in certain member states, um, be it in the European Parliament? And uh, is your standpoint still that we can read the final draft as a reverse qualified majority that would be necessary to block? Well, uh, uh, more in general, I have to explain that it was already in 2018 and then the run up to this uh, uh, presentation, a discussion how we can further uh, strengthen rule of law and, and address deficiency in this area. And we have made a, a link uh, to the uh, so to, say, to the effect uh, um, um, uh, it could have if there are deficiencies on the on the so to say, European budget, and this was in a kind in a in, in a way that the the, the the connex we created, and here we um, uh, proposed uh, a draft legal act in 2018, where we said in case there are breaches. Um, um, and we um, uh, propose sanctions. Uh, this can be only be overruled by the European Council with a reversed qualified majority. So a qualified majority has to vote against uh, the proposal of the Commission in order to overrule uh, this proposal. Um, uh, in February and now confirmed uh, also in, in, in Last uh, in, in the in the last European Council, uh, this uh, quasi important uh, notion reversed was deleted, but the the, the Commission still sticks to its uh, original proposal in 2018. I understand this is also the overwhelming um, uh, opinion of uh, and conviction of the European Parliament, and indeed it it will be subject to not easy negotiations between the Council and uh, the Parliament, but there are also other issues. Because what has been now uh, quasi decided, adopted at uh, the last European Council was a, a put political commitment to it. And now it is, uh, it was, uh, and is the task of the German presidency together with the member states uh, to, to, to put this uh, declarations into um, quasi a legal text, which has to be done, then negotiated with the parliament. But the commission position is still the same like in 2018. And I understand that uh, in particular, this rule of law issue is one of the, um, um, if you like, um, um, uh, lighthouse uh, topics of the European parliament uh, when it comes to the overall package. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And one more follow up on the nitty gritties of the discussion and uh, difficult negotiation process. There has been a lot of calculations uh, about who pays how much and who receives how much. And part of the negotiation process were the rebates uh, that uh, uh, primarily, or it looks like, went to the countries that were on the frugal side of the discussion. Could you? Please lead us uh, more about the future of the rebates and uh, uh, potentially the character and the nature of the discussions that led to the current agreement. Well, I mean, uh, the, the history of uh, the rebates is, uh, is, is going back uh, till the days when a famous British Prime Minister said, uh, I want my money back. 
Uh, and this uh, created, so to say, the concept of rebate. And then uh, there was the rebate of the rebate. Uh, and this uh, um, concerns uh, some, some member states. And uh, indeed, uh, after the unfortunate uh, leave of uh, the United Kingdom, in principle, uh, the, the, the idea of the rebate of the rebate has, has gone. And, and so the, the Commission proposed in its uh, original proposal of, of May 2018, um, the, the, so say, the disappearance of uh, the rebate for the future. But of course, it's uh, like always uh, part of uh, a political debate. It's something which is uh, in some countries very sensitive. Uh, often it's, it's less about the absolute uh, amount of money. It's more the, the symbol uh, to get the rebate and to give the impression that there's a rebate. Uh, so in general, uh, it was part of, uh, of the final package where uh, one has to compromise. Um, I have to say um, that now at least the calculation has been um, uh, simplified. But uh, uh, in general, one could say uh, at the European level, we have um, um, established um, a kind of, I can even say tradition, that uh, if we negotiate um, a new MFF, of course, there are very often changes. And for instance, if you take cohesion as an example, the idea of cohesion is indeed to converge between the poorer ones and the richer ones as a final goal. And uh, this means that uh, the poorer ones are catching up. And um, if they are successful in this uh, endeavor, uh, of course, uh, quasi the, the reaction, the downside is uh, to get less money in the future uh, because uh, the, the, the original idea, uh, so the goal has been in a way achieved. Uh, but in order to avoid um, steep um, declines in the financial allocation in a certain program, we are used to introduce so-called safety nets, which means that um, there is a, a maximum loss uh, in case um, there might be an overproportionate, if you like, loss. And the same applies the other way around. Uh, in case there would be a steep increase of a national contribution, also here we introduce uh, uh, a safety net in order to avoid that the, the increase is too steep. And in this spirit, uh, one has to see also the debate about the rebates. Uh, and one should not forget one of the challenges we faced originally was that, of course, due to the leave of the United Kingdom, the second biggest net, uh, net contributor uh, has left the Union. And uh, this has to be reflected in a way in the next budget. And there was a very early um, decision that, uh, so to say, half of the loss uh, should be compensated by higher national contributions and half of the loss has to be saved. And in a way this has, was implemented in our proposal and in order finally to get a package which is uh, um, as it uh, is the case, acceptable for everybody, we had uh, uh, still uh, to stick to the rebate and uh, this is how it is now for the next seven years. And then indeed we have to see how things evolve also in the way that uh, today's uh, still beneficiaries, some of them might become hopefully uh, at least uh, on a calculatory basis, net contributors. And uh, hopefully the convergence is uh, even further um, successful. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can um, use the opportunity to ask some of the questions that we have received um, some of them have already been touched upon, but um, I think that when we when we talk about the uncertainty um, that we still not know if the next generation EU um, will complement in that form uh, due to the challenges that you have described, Commissioner, uh, with the national parliaments, 
um, and it will be possible to start in the 1st of January uh, next year. We have received a question um, when the citizens will actually see the impact and um, also how um, the, the planning of the absorption of these funds and the reporting on how to use them uh, will look like. Yeah, I think um, uh, it's important if it's about uh, um, the impact for citizens and ideally also the visibility of the European contribution, which may I say very much depends if it is uh, uh, also um, communicated by uh, national political actors uh, and, and, uh, and, and media, etc. Um, uh, we have already um, reacted immediately after the outbreak. For instance, since uh, mid of March, the Commission took far more than 500 decisions related to the COVID crisis. Out of these more than 500 decisions, more than 200, almost 300, are so-called um, uh, state aid decisions where we have uh, supported uh, and assisted member states uh, to provide necessary immediate financial support to their people, to their business sector in order to, to, to react to the, to the crisis. Second, uh, there was already uh, around Eastern uh, an agreement about altogether 500, uh, uh, 540 billion euro different uh, programs. One of them was a, new, a newly created so-called SURE program aiming to help in particular those member states which don't have a, a so-called short uh, uh, um, um, short time uh, no uh, uh, um, short time um, uh, employment scheme in place. Uh, for altogether 100 billion euro. Um, we have also um, eased the conditions uh, for the use of uh, in particular structural funds so that uh, the remaining amount of money from the current period can be indeed uh, used also for repair actions um, um, related to the crisis. Um, and um, uh, so we, a lot of activities, initiatives have already taken place and they will continue in the new programming cycle. The next uh, important um, so to say, program is the so-called REACT EU program, which is, should be understood again as a repair instrument, which now is uh, foreseen to be uh, worth 47.5 billion euro and which will um, retroactively enforce from the 1st of February this year. So um, expenditures related to the crisis can be, um, uh, so to say, submitted um, as soon as we have uh, the money available uh, in order to be reimbursed by uh, this react program. And, and so these are the, the immediate reaction activities. And then quasi as a second step, uh, we have this huge recovery and resilience program, which should again help to recover the economy, but also to make not only the economy, but also the different societies more resilient. And this should be based on national uh, reform plans, which are, if you like, matched with the European semester recommendations, which are finally adopted uh, by the Commission, endorsed by the European Council, and then step by step implemented uh, uh, by the different member states and um, um, in, uh, disbursements are linked to the achievement of certain milestones in order to have this necessary control, which was um, heavily discussed uh, uh, during the, the, the European Council. And I think now also here we have a, a system in place which really guarantees that the money is well spent, is spent in a sustainable manner, is by the way spent 
in a way which is um, uh, respecting our main political priorities, Green Deal and digitalization. So it's something future oriented uh, and, and should be again seen as an investment in making um, Europe and uh, so the, the different member states more resilient, more fit for the future. Because as I'm always saying, there will be again um, a new crisis. We don't know when and what are the reasons for it, but uh, one should be better prepared, better equipped uh, for a potential future crisis. But also we should not forget uh, the global competition will further uh, increase, will become further dynamic. And here it's also important that Europe is able uh, to react, to be still a key player in many areas, ideally to be a first mover and not a follower. That's also the concept of strategic autonomy is uh, so important. Thank you very much, Commissioner, also for putting it into the forward-looking perspective. Um, I will package a couple questions that we are receiving from the participants. Uh, the first package would be uh, concerning the timeline and the system. Lily Bayer from Politico would be very grateful if you could elaborate a bit more in detail on the calendar of the talks and especially when the national parliaments can begin ratifying the proposal. And uh, also our participants are very eager to know about the timeline for the drawing up of the national economic reform plans when those are due and how exactly the system that you just mentioned uh, of monitoring of whether the money is well used and whether the national plans are corresponding to the priorities of the commission how exactly this system is going to function well on the first uh, as i said um, i hope uh, uh, we will get um, a decision in in October, we have two uh, uh, plenaries uh, of the European Parliament, and I hope at the latest in the first plenary, uh, there could be a decision. And then, of course, um, uh, it has to be sealed also by the European Council. But then immediately, uh, member states could start, uh, so to say, uh, discussing and negotiating it uh, in their respective uh, national parliaments. Uh, again, we should also not... Uh, uh, forget that in some member states there are two chambers uh, uh, and uh, this means that uh, most likely both chambers have to ratify this. So it's, it's, it's a, a lot of uh, uh, so say political logistics uh, which is uh, necessary, uh, but again it depends on, on the political will and uh, so to say the, the understanding how urgent uh, this is, but if there is really uh, um, say a joint political will, it should be possible to have it ratified till the end of the year. And I hope uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not too naive and too optimistic. Uh, concerning the second question, um, it's, um, uh, by the way, this ratification includes, and maybe we can talk also about the huge achievement of this uh, last European Council, uh, the introduction of new own resources. And there will be on, one own resources. This is uh, the levy for uh, non-recycled plastics, which has already been decided. And this, of course, uh, also has to be ratified by the national parliaments. But this can be done uno acto with the, uh, in case of the own re um, resources uh, ceiling. Uh, uh, but coming back to the second, um, so to say, these uh, national plans, um, member states, after there is an agreement between the parliament and uh, the council, according to our proposal, if this is not uh, changed, member states have the, uh, so to say, the opportunity to come forward up to 18 months after uh, this agreement uh, has been taken with a proposal. Um, what, uh, so to say, a reform plan can, could look like. And then, of course, it has to be discussed with the Commission on the basis of our uh, uh, country-specific recommendations. It's now up to the member state to accelerate this process. And I understand, for instance, Italy will already have such a plan in October this year available. If this is the case, indeed, we can enter immediately into negotiations and we can have 
an agreement probably at the beginning of uh, next year. So ideally, we can um, um, so say, um, um, harmonize uh, the discussion concerning the plan uh, with the uh, so to say ratification process and our uh, possibility uh, to issue bonds uh, um, uh, concerning the timing and then immediately so to say the implementation can start so it's really up to the member states how quick uh, this will be done and um, um, if i take the example of italy uh, if it really becomes uh, quasi a reality it could be rather fast. And then, of course, I have, I think, already explained how the control mechanism could look like. Again, it's very much uh, on the Commission side uh, to be tough on the different conditions in terms of the planning uh, on the agreement, if I take uh, climate change, uh, digitalization, etc. But then also when it comes to monitor, uh, and, and here um, we have seen this discussion uh, at the European Council, in particular with the Dutch representative, the Dutch Prime Minister, that the Council would like, uh, if necessary, to look into it, but I'm sure this uh, will and should not be necessary. Commissioner, thank you very much. We need to uh, look a bit at the time because there is a lot of questions open, so we'll try to uh, put together some of the questions that have been uh, raised with regards to the budget and the cuts that you have mentioned. Um, on the one hand side, is it um, something that will uh, influence the possibility of the European Union with uh, regards to enlargement, um, especially now that um, the EU has uh, given the green lights to start negotiations with North Macedonia and Albania. We also have um, a question with regards to uh, border protection and um, if there are, um, if COVID is not potentially going to cause a new um, uh, increased number of uh, migration and if the EU will then be uh, ready to deal with this and in conjunction with it, we have also uh, received the question if these cuts um, are not actually undergoing the idea of the European Union and its member states to become more resilient, um, as we have seen that it's especially, as you mentioned, in uh, science, in uh, healthcare, and uh, so on. Well, um, I understand that uh, um, in the assessment of uh, the European Council, um, many people, in particular media, uh, but also in the European Parliament, for instance, are used to compare the outcome with uh, the draft of the European Commission, in particular of uh, May this year. And of course, we have been ambitious, and we know that we have to be in particular ambitious in areas which, uh, which uh, where the management is done at the European level, because we know from the past, and it's very, it's a very, um, so to say, usual uh, pattern that member states, if they uh, discuss and finally decide about cuts compared to the proposal to the draft, are usually not cut symmetric but asymmetric, and they used to cut more in programs where they cannot calculate precisely their national return. Uh, and they are much more in favor of programs like cohesion and agriculture, both, by the way, uh, having um, decreased in absolute terms compared to the current uh, um, perspective, um, uh, because this is something where they can calculate precisely the return. But for instance, in Horizon, where the, uh, the, uh, the provision of, uh, of money is based on, uh, so to say on, on calls and on merits, uh, it, uh, it's not uh, calculable uh, what will be really the, the share of a member state. So this is the reason why uh, the, the, the pattern of cuts is uh, like this. 
having said all this, it's important to compare um, what is the budget, for instance, for Horizon, for Erasmus in this period and how it looks now after the decision of the council. Hmm. And here I have to say, for instance, Horizon, the current budget is 65 billion. Um, according to the agreement of the European Council, it's 80 billion. Um, um, Erasmus is 13 point something. And uh, uh, the, the new um, budget is more than 20. Uh, so there is an increase, for instance, in Erasmus by more than 50 percent, but it's it's less than we have, so to say, proposed. Uh, mm -hmm. Indeed, but it's so to say our experience how we have to negotiate, how we have to prepare things in order to get finally a significant increase. Would we have been modest, uh, we would have nevertheless faced, um, um, so to say, cuts. So it was uh, necessary to be very ambitious in order to get um, um, a rather uh, significant um, increase. So if you look at the uh, so to say, portion between the traditional uh, programs, cohesion and agriculture, and uh, the, the other uh, uh, more new policies, uh, this has uh, changed, not dramatically, but it has changed into, into the direction of, uh, so to say, um, increasing the share of the more modern policies. But this is also the result of uh, political developments and uh, also political decisions. For instance, seven, eight years, nine years ago, when we were discussing the current MFF, uh, migration was not the topic. Nobody was thinking about anything. The same applies for the previous uh, MFF, where mm -hmm. nobody was thinking about the Arab Spring, and then it happened. It has to be uh, in a way, um, and we had to react also financially on these developments. And therefore, uh, today, indeed, we have an increased um, uh, budget for uh, border management in general, it's less than originally uh, proposed by us, but it's still significant more. And I think in that respect, we are uh, prepared. Of course, uh, nobody can predict what are uh, the developments in the next seven years, but also here, we have now introduced um, uh, so-called flexibility instruments, which might give us some more uh, room for maneuver and quick reaction uh, than it was the case uh, currently. In terms of uh, uh, enlargement, um, the location for the Western Balkans is still significant. And again, uh, this should not in a way harm uh, their progress. And again, it depends very much on them how fast uh, the progress towards membership uh, uh, goes on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I believe that our time with you is uh, up. Uh, so we definitely did not go through all the questions that we had answered. So we very grateful for your time, for your outlining for us the, this indeed historic deal. We do hope that the implementation of the deal will be equally historic. And we also hope to reconnect with you somewhere in late October to check on the progress of the discussion, both with the parliament, but also with the national parliaments uh, and the implementation of the deal. Thank you very much once again for your time with us. Thank you for your contributions. And uh, we're looking forward to have you with us again. Thank you. You're welcome and um, hope to see you soon indeed and uh, greetings from Brussels. Take care of you.